أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم محمد اللهم صل وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح عالمين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, mourners of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein Assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh One of the most difficult and by far most challenging tasks you will ever undertake in your life will be raising good children. It's a challenging task because you're not dealing with robots that can be easily programmed or reprogrammed. You're dealing with another human being with their own emotions and feelings with their own needs and desires and wishes. It's a very, very difficult thing to do and yet the continuation, the survival of our species but more importantly of our civilization and heritage rests on providing a good upbringing to our children. And as sensitive a task as that is, and as challenging an undertaking as that will be for all of us, sadly the reality is, and I am very sorry to say this, my dear brothers and sisters, but I speak from experience. I speak from an experience that has been built on many years of interacting closely with community members around the world. This isn't something that's exclusive to this community. It's not something that has to do with an Eastern environment or a Western environment. This applies across the board. The sad reality is that in this day and age, we are not doing the task the way we are supposed to. And this comes down to different factors which go beyond the scope of tonight's talk. It has to do more often than not with a lack of education on the part of the parents. It has to do with the reality that most parents are ill-equipped to deal with their own marital problems, let alone raising good children. Many of us enter into marriage unprepared. And the subject of marriage lies beyond the scope of tonight's talk. That's something I'll leave for another time and another place. But the fact is that we enter the state of marriage unprepared. We deal with things in an ad hoc manner, meaning that we try and handle any situation that might come up by doing the best we can. But that's just not good enough. Remember, we're dealing with the next generation. 
we're dealing with people who will preserve our legacy. We're dealing with people who will carry our name. We're dealing with these children who will grow one day becoming good, productive members of society or unfortunately, as is often the case, individuals who do nothing to further the welfare of their communities and their families. And so I think this is a subject that must be addressed and whether or not you're a parent yourself, whether or not you're married at this point in time, this is something that's incredibly important for you to consider. As a matter of fact, if you're not a parent, if you're not married right now, you need to pay even closer attention to what I'm about to say because many of the steps that must be taken for providing a good, positive upbringing for children starts way before the birth of your child. So pay close attention, inshallah. We will try and seek inspiration from the legacy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and the University of Ashura so that we may reap the maximum benefits. Remember, we talked about this on the first night and the second night. Let's not be content with just attending the majalis and shedding a few tears for Aba Abdullah al Hussein, as important as that is. But that's only your ticket into the university. That is Imam al Hussein. That is your way of getting through the door. Now that you're here, now that you're ready to board the Ark of Salvation and seek guidance from the lantern of Aba Abdullah, let's try and reap the maximum benefits. Let's use these opportunities that have been made available to us by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start our lives on the right track, inshallah. Now, as I said, and I'm very sorry to say this, but I'm sure you can relate to what I'm saying. Sometimes I see a person, a father, who has a 26-year-old son. And I'm like, brother, why is it your son married yet? And the very common response that I often get is, well, he's still a boy. And you know what? I can't argue with that. I take one glimpse of his son, and even though he's 26 years old, he's 27 years old, really all I see is a spoiled brat. All I see is an individual who's a good-for-nothing individual who has wasted his life on watching Netflix and sitcoms on television. All I see is a person whose birth certificate says he's an adult, but really all he is is a man-child, or a woman-child, or whatever the female equivalent of that notion is. I take one look at the girl, and in spite of the age, all I see, and again, I'm very sorry to have to say this, I'm not talking about your good selves. I look in front of me, and what I see is a group of beautiful individuals who have come here wearing black in honor and commemoration of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. I'm speaking in abstract terms. I'm not speaking about any specific individual. If anything, I deserve this more than any one of you. But I take one quick look at the girl and all I see is a person who squanders the vast majority or at least a good number of hours of her daily time on taking Instagram selfies in her bedroom mirror or spends time, wastes valuable, precious time to watch beauty videos on YouTube or gossip with her friends and her family. How pathetic is that? That at that age, at an age where brothers and sisters those who were killed in Karbala had an average age of 22 and 23. The children in Karbala were like adults, and yet our own adults are like children. Where are we going with this? How sad a reality is this? And mind you, I'm not saying that the two examples I cited, the man and the woman, 
are not ready to get married. I think that's another satanic trap that tells you as a parent and tells you as a youth that, oh, I'm not ready to get married. If you think about it, really, these two are perfect for each other. It's a match made in heaven. So it's not that they're not ready to get married. They're just not ready to become adults. They're still children. Whereas the children of Karbala were men and women. Look at Abdullah ibn Janada. This person's name might not be familiar to you. And the reason for that is while anyone who entered the battle on the day of Ashura introduced themselves to the enemy. Not just to the enemy, but to all of history. When they would step into the battlefield, they would say things, Ana ibn Ana, for instance, the famous poetry by Al Qasim ibn al Hassan, who said, In Tunkiruni fa ana najlul Hassan, najlul nabiy al Mustafa wal Mu'taman. If you don't know who I am, here is who I am. I am the son of Hassan. These war songs or these verses of poetry were intended to strike fear in the hearts of the enemy, to remind them of who they were fighting. But this person steps into the battlefield and instead of introducing himself, he introduces his master. What does he say? Quite famously, he says that my master is Aba Abdullah al Hussein. My master is the one you are all trying to kill. His name was Abdullah ibn Janada. He was a young boy. He marches towards Imam al Hussein when the Imam started saying, Allah al min nasirin yansuruna. According to some accounts, the Imam repeated this statement five times on the day of Ashura. Each one of those is worthy of analysis and discussion. Why the Imam said this at this point? and not in any other. But perhaps one of the last times Imam al Hussein cried out, is there no one to help us? Historians say that children began to emerge from their tents. Al Qasim ran out saying, Labbaika ya amma, here I am, O oh uncle. Don't you ever say you don't have any supporters while you'll still have me. And he was only 14 years old. His younger brother Abdullah, came out of the tents also saying, لَبَّيْكَ يَا أَمَّهِ I'm here to get killed for you. Here I am to defend you and defend the women and the children. So this young man by the name of Abdullah ibn Janada approaches Imam al Hussein while he's dragging his sword. Now you can imagine like a seven, ten year old boy can't even carry a sword. So what he's doing is he's, he's dragging it on the sand. He comes to the Imam. He says, Ya Aba Abdullah, would you give me permission to go fight for you? The Imam looks at this young boy and he says, his father was just killed in the battle. Take him back to his mother. What's he doing over here? Do you know what he says to the Imam? He says to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, inna ummi man albasatni la mataharbi. It was my mother who dispatched me to you. It was my mother who put the shield on me and gave me the sword. It's my father's sword. It's my daddy's sword. I want to go and fight. Would you give me permission? Allahu Akbar. Amiri Hussein wa ni'm al Amir was his poetry. The children in Karbala were men and women. Their development, psychological development, was accelerated on the day of Ashura and they became inspiration for every adult ma male and female for as long as there is a sun that rises every day. So why is it that when we look at our own communities, we look at our own societies, we're dealing with children even though they're adults according to their birth certificates and their identification. So, it's a very sensitive task. Raising good children to be followers of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, to be defenders of the Hussein of the time, Imam al Hujjat ibn al Hassan al Mahdi, arwahuna li turabi maqdamih al Fida. Recite a salawat for the hastening of his reappearance.
The Imam needs loyal supporters just like Imam al Hussein. Can I or any of my children claim to be worthy of that honor? So what do we do? This is the question that's on everyone's mind. I'd like to mention a few points, a few very practical points for you to apply in your own life as well as the lives of your children, your siblings. If you don't have any children, you might have little brothers and sisters. You can play a pivotal role in their upbringing, in their spiritual, psychological, emotional development, inshallah. Zurara ibn A'yan, let me mention a story here, was one of the best and most qualified and most loyal companions of Imam al-Baqir and later Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. According to one hadith of Imam al-Sadiq, the Imam says, had it not been for several companions whom he names, including Zurara, he says that the religion of my ancestors, the religion of Rasulullah would have been annihilated. One of them is Zurara ibn Ayyan. Zurara was not a Shia to begin with. Do you know who converted him? Do you know who helped him find the light of the Ahlul Bayt? It was his sister. Not only did this sister, this young woman, help raise good men and women like Zurara ibn Ayyan, she also converted her entire family, seven siblings. Yes, a young girl can help steer seven brothers and sisters into the right direction. So even if you don't have children of your own, you might have brothers and sisters. Now, a few practical points I'd like to mention is this. The first is, you might have heard a very famous tradition by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam who says, that a child's life before they enter into adulthood should be divided into three phases. The first, each one, lasts seven years. The first one, the Prophet says, the first seven years, الطفل سيد, the child is to be treated like a master, meaning that he's boss, meaning that it's time for the child to be a child. It's time for the kid to be a kid. Don't overburden them. Don't put too much pressure on them. Don't force them into religion. Don't try to discipline them too much because those are the years where children are supposed to be children. That's the period in their lives, that's the phase when their brains are developing, their personalities are taking shape, and so, during those years, you let them be kids, right? The second phase, and I'll get back to that phase later. The second phase, the second seven years of their lives, so from the time they're eight until they enter, roughly for boys when they enter into puberty at around the age of 15, that's the time when you really try and mold their personality. The Prophet says, the first seven years, Sayyid, the second seven years, Abd, he's a slave. He is to be disciplined. He or she is to be provided with a proper and good positive education. Of course, that's not to say that we should resort to violence of any kind. That's not to say that children should be physically abused. Education, brothers and sisters, and a good upbringing is essentially a soft, approach. It's not hard. It's a software as opposed to a hardware. You are supposed to utilize every trick in the book to steer them gently, to give them nudges towards the right direction. Do not resort to physical violence because that will always backfire. It never yields any good results. So the second phase is when you are supposed to discipline them as much as possible. The third phase, the Prophet says, is when they become your counsel, is when they become your advisors. In other words, if you've done your job right in the first and second phases, then the third stage is when you begin to reap the benefits of this upbringing. That's the point in time when your son, your daughter, becomes your advisor and your helper and someone who helps you in uh, not just your life, but also in their own. There's another hadith 
that's not as famous as this one, where the Holy Messenger of Allah is quoted as having said that the second stage is when you are supposed to teach your children al-halal wal-haram. In other words, there comes a point when your child is roughly eight, nine, ten, and upwards, that's when you're supposed to teach them what is right and what is wrong. You're also supposed to teach them what is haram, what is permissible, and what is impermissible. In other words, religious education is provided at that age. Now, I remember reading a book that talked about how the Jewish community was able to preserve its identity. I mean, Jews, I think yesterday or a couple of days ago, were celebrating over 5,000 years of their history. Now, you can't help but admire the fact that after 5,100 and odd years, Jews have been able to preserve their identity, their religious identity, as well as their ethnic identity, in a very big way. Their language has obviously changed from its early days. There was, there's ancient Hebrew and there's modern Hebrew. There's also Yiddish, which is basically a, a German dialect where Hebrew is incorporated into German as well as other Eastern European languages. But the point I'm trying to make is that they've done a really good job. And I think that's something for us to take a lesson from. And I was reading this book and it talked about some of the strategies that they employed. One of them is this. They say that a lot of Jewish schools in Europe and some here in the United States as well, they actually divide the curriculum into two equal parts. Just think about this for a moment. The curriculum, the hours they spend at school are divided into two equal parts. The first is, has to do with religious education and the second is where they take their secular education. Now isn't that amazing? In other words, they dedicate half of their education to religious learning and experiences. Religious education is given as much importance as secular education. Let me say something here, brothers and sisters. I see a lot of parents who are prepared to spare no effort, who are prepared to put their life savings into providing their children with a quality education. Right? If they value education, they'll say, I'll send you the, to the best private schools. They even send their ki kids to private kindergartens. They start with private schools at that very young and tender age, so as to give their children what? A head start in life. They care about their children. They really want their children to have a secure future, to get into the best colleges, to end up getting the best and highest degrees and have a good stable income and, and, and be independent and have uh, become productive members of, of society. But isn't it amazing that while we're prepared to do all of that for our children to be provided with their best possible chance in a secular education and therefore have, you know, to, to be in the top 1%, but when it comes to their religion, there's almost nothing there. When it comes to providing our children with a solid future as far as their spirituality is concerned, how much effort do we put in there? How often do we think about taking our kids for ziyarah instead of a vacation? Instead of spending endless cash on vacations in Florida and elsewhere, or even back home, whether it be Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, Instead of that, to actually tailor make a trip that's designed to uplift them spiritually, to nourish them emotionally, to take them for the express purpose of ziyarah, the express purpose of hajj and umrah. How often do you see that in this day and age? Instead of worrying about my kids' future and what's going to happen to them in 20 years' time, making sure that we have a college fund from the day they're born. How much do we think about their religious education from the day they're born? How about the idea of taking my kids to ziyarah, 
taking them by the hand and then saying, Ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein, I want you to look after my son or my daughter. I want you to make them servants of yours. How often do you see that in this day and age? Instead of relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the Ahlul Bayt, on the Prophet, on the Quran, and on religion, we rely on our own little planning and scheming for the future of our children. How sad is that? Brothers and sisters, what needs to happen? Listen carefully. Our children, if only we applied this hadith. It's a hadith narrated by Sunnis as well as Shia scholars. The hadith says, and I quote, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ I'll translate. أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ عَلَى ثَلَاثِ عَلَى حُبِّ نَبِيِّكُمْ وَحُبِّ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ if you wish to give your child a good, proper education and upbringing, these are the three pillars upon which the process needs to rest. The first thing you do is the Prophet says, Addibu. Addibu means discipline. Addibu means it's not just something you say. Rather, it's an immersive environment, it's a milieu, it's a social environment that you need to provide for your children, one that is conducive for a good religious moral upbringing. Addibu, number one. Number two, awladakum, which includes both boys and girls. Ala hubbi nabiyyikum. Discipline them such, give them an upbringing such, Provide them with an education such that they love their messenger, Rasulullah. Number one. Number two, وَحُبِّ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ And the family of the Prophet. Incidentally, I was watching a TV channel that's based out of Egypt. It's called Qanatul Rahma, the channel of mercy. But what it really should be called is Qanatul Niqma, the channel of misery, the channel of hate. There's a sheikh by the name of Ash-Sheikh Al-Adwi, Mustafa Al-Adwi. Incidentally, Adwi literally translates as enemy, subhanAllah. Ismun ala musamma. This sheikh Al-Adwi is sitting, a Wahhabi sheikh, sitting in front of the TV screen answering questions. He gets a call from a woman. The woman says to him, Ya sheikh, I've heard a hadith narrated by Tabarani and others. Where the Prophet says, Discipline your children in the love of your Prophet and the love of his family. Immediately before she got to finish the question, he said, غير صحيح. That's inaccurate. That's not true. Subhanallah. I thought to myself, no wonder your women's wombs keep churning out ISIS inbreds when you have this mentality. No wonder you're filled with so much hate and venom. The minute you hear the name of the Ahlul Bayt, you say it must be wrong. It must be inaccurate. Which part of this hadith, I ask you, O oh, Adwi, which part of this hadith do you have a problem, problem with? That the Prophet said you should teach the love of your messenger to your children? Surely you don't have a problem with that. Is it the part where the Prophet says you should teach your children to recite the Qur'an? Surely you don't have a problem with that. So which is it? Which is it? Other than the part which says you should teach the love of Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein to your children. That's the part you have a problem with? But doesn't the Qur'an say over and over again, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى doesn't the Qur'an say that they came to the Prophet saying, Ya Rasulullah, you've done all of this for us. Towards the end of his life, O Messenger of God, you have sacrificed everything for our sake, for our guidance. You have saved us, literally saved us from the brink of self-destruction and oblivion. 
Is there anything we could do to show appreciation? Is there a gift we could give you that would make you happy? The Prophet said, no, there is nothing except for one thing, and that is for you to show love and compassion to my family. Ya Adwi, Ya Wahhabi, Ya Nasibi. What is wrong with that part of the hadith? Let me go back to the main point. This hadith is mentioned by both Sunnis as well as the Shia. It's only the Wahhabis that can't get themselves to accept it. What does the Prophet say? He says, discipline your children on loving the, your Prophet, the Messenger of Allah, his family, and reciting the Quran. Let me talk a little bit about this. Let's zoom in a little. What does it mean to discipline your children? It means a number of things. First off, we talked about the immersive environment. Bringing your kids, you know, I'm not trying to flatter myself or anything. It's just a thing I have. You know how some speakers are sometimes irritated if there are kids in the hall, in the audience, right? Running around, playing, screaming, laughing, this, that. I myself, I have taught myself not to be the least bit irritated with that. Why? Because I see the value of children being in these places. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to get all your kids. Bring them to these majalis. Bring them to Salat al Jum'ah. Bring them to the gatherings that are held in memory of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. When they come week in and week out, year in and year out, you've provided them with that immersive environment. Number one. Number two, and this is important, you need to help your children associate these experiences with things that are sweet and nice. Let me give you a few very quick examples. And, and these are things that I've tried myself with my own family and my own children. So for example, there's this weekly program that I attended while in Sydney in Australia. And this was every Friday night. And on that particular program, I always take my whole family. And every time after we finish the program and we're headed back home, every time without fail, the kids know it, I know it, we go out for some ice cream. Now it's not every day that you go out for ice cream with your family. But if you're going to do that, then do it at a time where they've already engaged in a good positive religious experience because what that does is that subliminally subconsciously they will grow associating going to the majlis with having ice cream with their family and so they will always think of this experience as something that's positive and uplifting and the worst thing you can possibly do god forbid and i see this happening sometimes, is when you go out for a majlis, when you go out for salah, when you go out for dua, is for God forbid parents to become mean and nasty with their children on the way back home. Because they will always associate that experience. The mosque going experience will become one of bitterness, of sadness, and you don't want that. This is a concept psychologists talk about and it's called associationism, right? You associate the good act with something that they enjoy. This is very, very important. Another example is something that you might have heard from me or from other people, but it's something that we grew up with. And that is that ever since I was a little kid, and as long as I can remember really, my father would wake us up for Salat al-Fajr. And of course, you can wake your kids up for Salat al-Fajr by kicking them, right? It happens, let's face it. You could wake them up by pouring a bucket of water over their face. I'm not sure if that happens, but if it does, I'm sorry for you. Or you could be super cool about it and you could just call your kids up and if they don't wake up the first 20 times, you could keep doing it, knock at their door, pull the blanket, I don't know. This is the strategy my father employed. Every time it's time for Fajr, I would wake up with small, juicy, succulent pieces of fruit in my mouth. In other words, he would come sit right next to us, take those pieces of fruit, and he would mix them up. So every day it's something different. Sometimes it's sweet, sometimes it's sour, sometimes it's salty, sometimes... And so 
it's like a it's like a guessing game. Every day we're like we don't know what's going to end up in our mouth. But he would sit right next to us, takes takes those pieces of fruit, and he would put it in our mouth as he recited the following dhikr: Asbahna wa asbah al mulk lillah al wahid al qahar asbahna. The melodic recitation, coupled with the succulent pieces of apples and oranges and peaches in our mouth. You tell me what kind of an experience, what kind of a, an association, what kind of an upbringing as far as Salat al-Fajr is concerned, does that imprint your child with? You tell me. It's a very simple thing. But it's about, again, it's a soft approach. You don't scare them into Salat al-Fajr. You don't freak them out. What you're supposed to do is to gently but firmly, in other words, they have to wake up. If they don't wake up the first time, you try it the second time. But you keep doing it and it becomes an experience they want to go through. Right? Let me give you a few other examples which I think go a long way in explaining what I'm trying to say here. There was a, na a man, Rahmatullah alayhi, may Allah bless his soul. Some of you might be familiar with him, especially those from Iraq and Karbala. His name was As Sayyid Hassan al Shahristani. Sayyid Hassan al Shahristani was a prominent Karbala'i and a member of the family of a Shahristani in Iraq who lived in London. So, in many ways, we can relate to his experience. He lived in London, died, I would say, about 20 years ago. And so he was there in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And he also had his family. What's amazing to me is I've met many members of his family. I am yet to come across a single man or woman from the family of this man who was not on the straight path. SubhanAllah. Is it a miracle? No, it's not a miracle. Is it some divine mandate? It's not. Was he a prophet? No. Was his wife a prophetess? No. So what did he do? This is a secret. He owned a house of multiple, a multiple story house, say about four or five stories, I don't know. He lived on one level and his kids many of whom were adults and they had their own family, also lived in the other floors. He had installed speakers throughout the house. Every Fajr, he would wake them up with the recitation of the Adhan himself. So at the time of Fajr, a Sayyid Hassan gets up, their father, their grandfather, he recites the Adhan, everyone is, is expected to wake up. They all wake up, go down to the first floor where they gather together for Salatul Jama'ah. Brothers and sisters, sadly, we see a mosque and we assume that this mosque is supposed to raise my children, not myself. Raising your children happens almost exclusively at home. It's not supposed to happen at the mosque, although that helps. It's not supposed to happen in school, although that helps. But it's primarily location is in your home. So everyone would go down, they would all pray Salatul Fajr together as a congregation behind him, and then they would sit down and recite Dua al-Sabah by Amir al-Mu'mineen Salawatullahi alayhi. Beautiful Dua. Read that Dua tomorrow morning when you wake up for Fajr, and tell me you weren't inspired for the rest of the day. You weren't uplifted for the rest of the day. Unbelievable words of love being exchanged between Amir al Mu'mineen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they would recite that dua, they would finish, they would all have breakfast together, then everyone would go on their way. The student goes to school, the person who works goes to their business, and so on and so forth. 10 years, 20 years down the line, you have good, righteous, upright men and women who are proud to be children of this great man. And he was a regular person, by the way. He wasn't a scholar. He wasn't a, an erudite, a graduate of the Hawza. He was just a regular businessman. But subhanAllah, he had tawfiq. Another example is this. 
There's a scholar that I had met who passed away about 15 years ago, Rahmatullah Ta'ala Alayhi, by the name of Ayatollah Sheikh Murtada Alamul Huda. He lived in the holy city of Mashhad. This person, let's not talk about his background or his story, but he came from a very regular, very ordinary background. Didn't come from a long line of scholars or maraja or anything like that, right? But he joined the Hawza. He studied under the tutelage and supervision of Grand Ayatollah Mirza Mahdi al Asfahani, who was also a teacher for Ayatollah Sistani, Sheikh Wahid Khurasani, Sayyid al Mudarrisi, and other uh, ulama and other luminaries. So he studied under him. And then he had, he got married and he had a family of his own and he had children. Every single one of his children is a unique individual in the Hawza in Mashhad. Every one of them, and I've met them all. Every one of his children is a alim that has no equal. And I've benefited from one of his children immensely. Rahmatullah alayhi Sheikh Baqir, Alamul Huda, and I've translated one of his books into English under the title, Our Beliefs that you can get and I would encourage you to read. So, all of his children were model citizens. Everyone looked up to them. So one day, a person goes to Shaykh Murtada Alamul Huda, he says to him, Shaykh, you've done a really good job raising good children. I have recently become, I've recently got married and we're thinking of having children, me and my wife, we want to have kids. So what's your secret? Tell me what I'm supposed to do so that my children end up becoming um, anything close to what you have done with your kids. So the sheikh told him, he goes, oh, but you're too late, my son. He said, sheikh, but my kids aren't even born yet. My wife isn't even pregnant yet. He said, but you're still too late. He said, how is that? He said, I was thinking about how to raise my children even before I got married. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. Rasulullah says, Make sure you pick the right spouse because many psychological traits are transmitted from father to son, from mother to son and daughter, and so on and so forth. Be careful who you marry. I said this a couple of nights ago. Sisters, my dear sisters in faith, just because the guy happens to earn a good living or drive a fast car or have a chiseled chin or have a boy band charm, these things are worthless when it comes to giving birth to good children. These things are worthless. In fact, most of the time they end up backfiring you want to have children who will remember you after you're dead. You want to have someone who will say, Rahimallahu Abi, Rahimallahu Ummi. Prophet Isa alayhi salam was once walking and he came across a grave. Isa, like other prophets, he had the ability to go beyond the corporeal realm, the physical realm, and he could see into the, spirit, the spiritual realm. So he walked past this grave and he noticed that the person in that grave was being tortured for their sins. So he kept walking. Obviously the person deserved it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful but every once in a while the sins are too great and the person has to pay for them. So he keeps walking. The hadith says that about a year later Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus walks past the same site, the same grave. And he noticed that the person in that grave was no longer being tortured. He was no longer being agonized. So he says, oh Allah, oh God, last year this person was being agonized. This year he's doing okay, he's doing good. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, he said, this person had a young boy. This boy over the last year has grown up and he has matured. And he is now praying for his father. And it's because of his prayer that I have removed all agony from his father. We need kids who are going to remember us after we've been buried six feet under, brothers and sisters. Don't look for physical features which are worthless when it comes to having good children. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, listen to this. 
He says, I, I have never asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for children who are beautiful. I have never asked Allah for children who are handsome or tall or this or that. He said, but I have asked Allah for children who are God-fearing. And this brings me to another point about raising good children. Prayer. Brothers and sisters, it's a difficult task. We need help. We need all the help we can get. And the best source of that help is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constantly pray for your kids. Pray that you have good children. Anyway, so an immersive environment. Associate with good positive experiences. What needs to happen in Ashura, and I'll wrap up. What needs to happen is that our kids should be taught the heroic stances of Imam al Hussein. Instead of our children being obsessed with action figures and dolls and really pathetic little things that pop culture teaches us and marketing makes us buy, instead of that, let's teach them about Imam al Hussein, who, according to one ziyara, we say, Assalamu alayka ya batal al Islam. Peace be upon you, O hero of Islam. You're looking for real heroes? Go no further than Hussein. You're looking for a hero for your son or daughter? Go no further than Abbas and Zainab, brothers and sisters. I have a son. He's about five now. When he was three years old, so cute. At three, he'd come up to me and say, Dad, if there was a fight between Batman and Iron Man, who do you think would win? So that was like the first time I thought, you know what? This isn't right. Forget Batman, forget Iron Man. Let me tell you a little thing or two about Imam Hussein. Let me tell you something about Abdul Fadl al Abbas, Habib ibn Mudahir, Ali al Akbar. So what I started to, to do with him, and I've been doing this with my other kids, but with him in particular, because there was, this was the most recent experience, is every night, his bedtime story would be one that revolved around the Ahlul Bayt Instead of teaching your kids about the three little piggies, honestly, brothers and sisters, let's teach them about the Imams. There's another set of three piggies that we can teach them about, but that's another story for another day. But the Ahlul Bayt right? And so a few months went by and all I'm telling him is stories of the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt. So one day he comes up to me and he's like, Dad, Dad, I got a question for you. If there was a fight between Iron Man and Imam Hussein, who do you think would win? And I'm like, okay, that's still not quite what I was looking for, but you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Honestly, this happened. So then, obviously, I continue teaching and telling him the stories and whatever I could muster up. A few months later, he comes back. He says, Dad, I got a question. This is a tough one. I said, what? Shoot. He's like, if there was a fight between Imam Ali and Imam Hussein, who do you think would win? And I'm like, that's not quite what I was aiming for, but, you know, whatever, I'll take it. And I'm like... They're, they wouldn't fight because they're Imam Ali and Imam Hussein. He's like, really? He was so disappointed. I mean, that's pay-per-view material, right? Like Imam Ali and Imam... The point here is this, brothers and sisters. Oftentimes, the problem is that we ourselves as parents lack enough knowledge to teach our children. Educate yourselves so that your children are also educated. Pick up a book. One thing I recently started doing with my kids as well is that there is a book by Sheikh Abbas Al-Qummi, Salamullahi Alayh. The same author of Mafatih Al-Janan. This luminary for whom sometimes I do nudurat, brothers and sisters. When I'm in trouble, you know how people do another? I do another for Sheikh Abbas Al-Qummi. That's how much I love him. Sheikh Abbas Al-Qummi wrote a book called Muntaha Al-Amal. Look it up. Find it. Many of you, alhamdulillah, you speak Arabic, your children speak Arabic. Look up this book. What I do is this, I take the book, I open it from page one, and every day I read two pages to the kids. And if it, anything needs explaining, I'd explain, and I would tell the, essentially what the book is, is the history of the Ahlul Bayt. Muntaha al-Amal fi tawarikh al-Nabiyyi wal-Al. It's the history of the Ahlul Bayt. 
which we ourselves don't know most of the time. Let's give them that adab, that discipline, that education, that immersive environment. Give them incentives. Tell your kids, if you memorize al khutbah al-fadakiyya, I'll buy you a new Switch, Nintendo Switch, or whatever is selling like hot, hot potatoes nowadays. I don't know. Or I'll buy you this, or I'll buy you that. Give them an incentive. Get them to do this. I do this all the time. They did it with me. I know many other families that do this. It's beautiful. They learn something. And then the Prophet says, to go back to the main hadith, and we've run out of time, sadly. The Prophet says, وَتِلَاوَةُ Quran." Teach them to recite the Qur'an. So that when they're 15 and 16 and 20, they don't feel the Qur'an is a foreign object. They don't think of it as something so distanced and strange and mysterious. Teach them the Qur'an when they're kids. Teach them the Qur'an on a daily basis, if not at least on a weekly basis. Imam al Hussein one day brought a man to teach one of his children a little bit of Qur'an. Listen to this. Where are our priorities? This man came and he taught one of the kids of Imam al Hussein Surah Al-Hamd. How long does it take someone to teach a child Surah Al-Hamd? I don't know, an hour, two hours, three sessions? When he finished, Imam al Hussein took the most beautiful garments, the best clothes, and he gave them as a gift to that teacher. Then, he filled his mouth with gemstones. So some of the companions said to Imam al Hussein, Ma akthara ata'ak, you've given him a little bit too much than he deserves. He's only taught your child Surah Al Hamd. I mean, yeah, you know, say a thank you, maybe give him something, but not all this, gemstones. The Imam said, What I have given him is nothing compared to what he has given me to teach my children the Quran, familiarize them, acquaint them with the Quran, inshallah. Let's wrap up. I really do apologize. Sometimes. I feel bad right after the lecture. I feel I, I took too much of your time. So I do apologize once again. The upbringing of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, produced the likes of Abdullah ibn Muslim ibn Aqil. Abdullah ibn Muslim, you all know Muslim ibn Aqil. Inshallah tomorrow we'll mention his tragedy. But Abdullah ibn Muslim had a son who was there in Karbala. He was also 26 years old, but what a young adult this man was. What kind of a 26 year old are we talking about here? Imam al Zaman specifically mentions him in Ziyarat al Jami'ah. He says, Assalamu ala al Qatil ibn al Qatil, Abdullah ibn Muslim ibn Aqil, la'an Allahu qatilah. Imagine for Imam al Zaman to set aside an entire section of the ziyarah to mention this young man's name even though he was only in his 20s. Who was this man? On the eve of Ashura, when Imam al Hussein told his companions that tomorrow will be our last day. Tomorrow I will die. I will be killed. Then he said to them, Look at the darkness of the night. They're not looking to kill you. If they get a hold of me, they will be too distracted to kill any of you. So how about you use the darkness of the night, grab each other's hands and leave. I don't want anyone to stay back with me. Some scholars have said that Imam al Hussein even said that to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He told him, you can leave me. I can be here. I can take care of myself. He only asked for one person to stay with him and that was his the fruit of his heart, his son Ali ibn al-Akbar Salawatullahi alayh because that was his special sacrifice for Allah. But on that night when Imam al-Hussein told everyone to leave, guess who was the first person to get up and speak? It was Abdullah ibn Muslim ibn Aqil. Historians say that he stood up. He said, Sayyidi ya Aba Abdullah, Mada yaqulun nas fina in nahnu tarakna sayyidana wa mawlana what will people say if we abandon our master and we abandon you, our uncle? Imam al Hussein was his maternal uncle because his mother was Ruqayya bint Amir al Mu'mineen. So there was that very close relationship. 
And so he says to the Imam, how could I face people having abandoned you here in Karbala? Then he said, La Wallah, I swear to God, we won't leave until we are sacrificed before you. And until our blood is shed before yours is shed. This young man, Allahu Akbar, he gets up on the day of Ashura, heads towards the battlefield to fight the enemy. Historians say that he sent 97 people straight to the bottom of hell. Then as he was fighting, reciting chants and poetry and reminding everyone, Ana ibn Muslim ibn Aqil, that he is the son of Muslim ibn Aqil, it was at that point that someone fired an arrow in his direction. The arrow approached his forehead. So he raised his hands to block the arrow. The arrow penetrated the hand and pierced his forehead. And it sewed his hand into his face. Now this young man doesn't have a hand to fight with. So as he is standing, thinking of what to do, another arrow came and pierced through his heart and killed him right there. When he fell to the ground, his brothers, his nephews, other family members rushed towards him. Another set of the companions of Imam Al-Hussein were killed, trying to rescue Abdullah ibn Muslim. It was at that point that Imam al Hussein cried. He said, Mahlan, sabran ya bani umumati. O oh, my cousins, be patient. For you will never see any humiliation after this. This is one example. The other example are the children of Ummul Banin. Allahu Akbar. What Ummul Banin did? Ummul Banin was a martyr of Karbala, even though she was never there to begin with. How? Because when Bishr ibn Hadlam came back to Medina, you all know the story. Bishr ibn Hadlam was screaming off the top of his lung, Ya Ahl Yathrib, La Ya Muqam Alakum Biha, Qutil Al Hussein Fad Mu'i Midraru. As he entered the city of Medina, he mentioned the name of Hussein. A woman rushes out of her home. He says, I saw a woman, an older woman, carrying a young child. I didn't know who she was, but she rushed towards me. She said, oh man, who are you? And did I hear you mention the name of Hussein? Do you know anything about my son Hussein? He said, who are you, old woman? She said, I am Ummul Banin. I am the wife of Amir al Mu'minin. Bishr ibn Hadlam says, when I realized who she was, I said to myself, how can I break the news to her? I can't tell her what has happened to her children. So he said to her, Ja'far. Oh, Umm al before I tell you about Hussein, let me tell you that your son Ja'far died. She said to him, did I even mention the name of my son Ja'far? When did I ask about Ja'far? Tell me about my son Hussein. Remember it was Umm al who raised Aba Abdullah. He said, Uthman. She said, did I ask you about Uthman, my son? Tell me about Hussein. He said, Your son Abbas died in Karbala. It was at that point that the child she was carrying, who was a son of Abbas, Abbas fell to the ground. She said to him, Ya Bish, laqad qalbi. You have torn my heart apart. She then said to him, Abbas, An, Ja'far, Uthman, every one of my 
children are nothing but sacrifices for Hussein. Remember, Ummul Banin gave birth to these children so that they would be killed for the sake of Abba Abdullah. She said, I never asked you about my kids. Tell me about Hussein. It was at that moment that he told her, لَقَدْ تَرَكْنَا فِي كَرْبَلَا بِلَا رَاسِ We left the body of Abba Abdullah without a head in Karbala. Umm al began to cry. Ah, <laughs> عظم الله جريت بلي حسين بقى بوادي الطفوف بغير تكفي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون اللهم العن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا It's time for salah Inshallah we could all hurry to go and join prayers ila arwah al-mu'minin wal-mu'minat wa man mata ala hubbi ali muhammad nuhdi lahum thawab majlisina hadha wa thawab surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha ma'as-salawat